Canto 30 of The Purgatory is one of the great revelatory set pieces of the whole Divine Comedy. It's full of long extended similes through which Dante the poet recreates what I think he must have experienced when he was on the pilgrimage and was rocked both by the extraordinary things that he saw that are true of divine ways, but also what it cost him, how it wrung him through and through, because we human beings are free to see these things, which means that we must know ourselves through and through and become aligned with that which we can see, if only we can bear the price. Um, which comes out so powerfully in this canto. It begins with the first of the long similes, depicting Ursa Minor, um, the constellation in the sky which has the North Star at one end of the saucepan-like shape, that of course is the fixed point in the heavens around which all the other stars turn. Um, it doesn't set but we're also led to believe that we're half looking at the spiritual polar star around which everything turns in the way that Dante describes it. And then he says that the elders who have been leading the great procession that he had seen emerging before his eyes, so of course we're looking away from the chariot, they turn and look towards the chariot as if stars looking towards the North Pole star in the sky around which everything turns were given the sense that whatever's about to appear in this chariot is nothing less than that around which all things turn. And then through a series of chants and calls and divine beings appearing, Dante, the poet, has complete sort of takeoff in this canto. He is completely free to describe what he's seen, spiritually free. He is certainly using all that he knows from ancient and Christian history, but using that to convey to us how what he actually saw was something as much new as it was old, completely surprising, far from being expected. So what happens, first of all, is that one of the elders, we're led to presume it's the elder who is the Song of Songs author, Solomon, puts up the chant, Come Bride of Lebanon. So this is a female figure that we're led to start to wonder about. Then all the other elders join in with a great hallelujah, which Dante says resounded quite as much as the dead rising on the last day. So who is this Bride of Lebanon who seems like Christ, as the dead will call to Christ on the last day, according to the traditions? And then a hundred angels appear around the chariot. There are they arise as if out of nowhere, they're, they're throwing flowers into the air, and they sing, Blessed art thou who comes. So one of the great accolades for Christ, but again, turned towards whoever it might be that we're about to see appear amidst all this glory. And Dante also quotes a line from Virgil at this point, not even a Christian verse, saying, may our hands be full of lilies, a great cry of joy and festivity from the Aeneid. You know, if, if Dante the poet is here completely spiritually free to draw on all that's available to him to try to communicate the sight, I think this can only be because what he sees is the divine completely free and rejoicing in its self-revelation without hindrance, without limitation. You know, this is not a God 
who is possessive, who insists on things being shown in only the correct ways. This is not the jealous God that the church so often seems to want to protect. This is a God who will give of divine abundance in whatever way is possible, but also in whatever way is going to touch we human beings, is going to touch Dante in the most powerful, the most direct and the most transformative way. And then the vision at the centre of this revelation appears using quite an extended simile again, Dante the poet asks us to call to mind one of those sunrises where the night has been completely clear and the sky has turned a sapphire blue and there's a mist just above the horizon that enables us to actually watch the sun as it appears, not be directly dazzled by its globe but to experience and enjoy its swirling golden beauty. And he says, amidst all these flowers that the angels were throwing up into the air, like the sun appearing through the mist, so appeared a lady. She's dressed in white and green and red, the colours of faith, hope and love. And she's wearing an olive crown upon her head. This is the crown of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. This is Sapientia. This is the divine revelation directly for him. Before he says who it was, he turns spontaneously to Virgil. Presumably straight behind him, he says, much like a child would turn to its mother in a moment of shock or delight or surprise or just confusion. And Virgil is not there. My sweet father, he says, was not there. And in this moment of ecstasy, that's also confusion, it now becomes one of shock. He turns, realising that his body is gripped by this sight. He says he was trembling, he was in adoration. He remembers the enduring love which has so powerfully shaped his life. He's even got another line of Virgil's to share with Virgil. I think in kind of exaltation, he is going to use the line that Virgil had put in the mouth of Dido when she turns to Aeneas to express her love. She says, not a drop of blood in my body was not throbbing with this ecstasy of love. And yet it's also one of complete reversal. The lesser reversals, if you like, are he's quoting Dido, speaking of Aeneas, when he, Dante, is a man speaking of a woman. Dido also speaks these words when she is overwrought by love to the point of death and kills herself. Whereas Dante is using these lines to speak of being overwhelmed by love. Well, it is going to be a kind of death for him but one that's going to lead to a fuller and fuller life. So there's something prophetic and about this change of words. But the real shock is that as he turns, Virgil is not there. There's an absence, a space behind him when he was so used now to his sweet father, as he calls Virgil again, being right there, the one that he gave his soul to, placed his soul in Virgil's hands for his salvation. He has just disappeared and we never quite know how he's disappeared. But then the vision speaks and her first words are Dante, his name. And she tells him not to weep. Partly, I think, because Virgil's disappearance is actually part of the divine comedy too. This is a moment of great separation between Dante and Virgil. And as I've been sort of building up throughout my sense of trying to read these cantos, I think this is as much Virgil's salvation we've been depicting um, as a kind of support part in the great poem. 
And he now, this is the point where he must attend fully to his own salvation, even as Dante must now only attend fully to his. So it's a separation like the separation of death that is one of at once suffering, but also hope. So she can say to him, don't weep. But it is also a separation that's going to lead to the full on moment where he must change too and that is going to cause him to weep and so she says you're going to have greater reasons to weep actually here now just what lies in store for him on the other side of the weeping is intimated i think in beatrice using dante's name to address him it's the only time that dante's name is spoken in the divine comedy and Dante the poet in parenthesis actually apologizes for putting his name into his own work. It was seen as a sign of arrogance or pride to do so. But Dante must do so as well because the calling is nothing less than for him to become a co-creator of divine life. Most explicitly and clearly for us now in the Divine Comedy itself. So his being named by this revelation who we are powerfully being led to believe is nothing less than an incarnation of the Divine herself is a signal that he too is receiving a Divine name and that his manifesting in life is of the Divine as well. But it can only come when he fully and freely sees all of himself, understands himself, experiences himself fully through and through. Because if he can't do that, how can he possibly know, experience and understand the divine fully through and through? And so she now, Beatrice, launches, launches on her famous reproaches of Dante. She chastises him. She speaks clearly, piercingly, directly to the heart of his life. And it is pitiless. It says it's without mercy. It is so harsh that Dante casts his eyes down and by chance happens to catch a reflection of himself in the stream in front of him. And he can't tolerate it. He can't stand to look at himself and so it says that he raises his eyes to the grass it says also that he's like a child standing before its mother who is racked with guilt at having been seen and having been exposed it's so powerful that the angels dancing around beatrice take dante's side they start singing a psalm which includes lines about not being shamed by God, but by trusting in God and being placed in spacious, open places where you can feel free. Dante is profoundly moved by the angel's compassion and pity and what had become frozen hard at the thought of the reproaches inside him gradually melts. He uses another long simile to describe frozen mountains being gradually thawed by the light of the spring flame and like the snows melting and tumbling down the mountainside so too anguish and bitter tears start to pour out of him. But Beatrice tells the angels off for having sung this psalm, for having shown compity and it's a very fascinating moment because I think in a way the angels who see God's glory face to face but aren't free to see God's glory face to face in a way can't directly understand what Dante as a human being must undergo to also freely though fully see God's glory face to face. He must undergo this grief and lament which Beatrice is now putting him through in order that all of his being might be brought into the divine presence and show and know the divine life. And I think that's why she tells him off. This is about this awareness reaching into every part of who we are, 
in order that every part of who we are can immediately and directly know, grow and live in this divine awareness. The angels in a way only know it second hand as we human beings know it. We must learn to know it directly. And so she tells him, she tells them that this man, Dante, was not only given all the blessings of the cosmos that through their influences flowed into him at his conception, he was also given all the blessings of the divine spirit that was breathed into him at his conception. If you remember back to the story of how we're conceived and born and this meeting of both natural cosmic forces and divine spiritual forces. And at first, Beatrice explains, it looked like these seeds were going to bloom and blossom in his youth. It looked like he was going to become all that he might become as a human being. All his potential was going to be actualized, which again is another allusion to nothing less than his full divinization. That's what he was going to be able to bring to earth. His poetry, you might say, was going to be an incarnate manifestation of divine life. And it seemed like it was secured because he catches sight of her in her youth and the fullness of that love stirred and awoke in him. All seemed to be going well. Then she dies, she leaves, she parts from him, which from the viewpoint now is just this transition to divine life. The earthly life she had, which was just an echo or reflection of divine life, now became fully realised in her life as she left the earth to return to heavenly life fully. But Dante doesn't see that. Dante gets distracted. His awoken erotic life doesn't carry him into the heavens following Beatrice as she departs. Rather, he gets distracted, his erotic love falls down and looks for other distractions, looks for other things to, to possess. And so he strays, he searches for simulacra of the good, as Beatrice puts it. Things that look good but can't deliver on what they promise. But she still loves him. If his enduring love was faltering, her enduring love was not. And it's on these moments where you realise that this is a fully human story, as well as a divine revelation. Um, these different levels are working all together, suggesting in us that the little moments that seem like maybe an earthly infatuation can become pregnant with the possibility of lifting us to divine life. As we hear about Dante's struggles, we're invited to contemplate our struggles as well and ask where we're being led after simulacra or after the true good itself. Um, it's when the literal story of Dante and Beatrice in life becomes a tropological higher moment where our hearts can turn and so reach the anagogic state in this multiple layered reading of the Divine Comedy. And Beatrice says that in her love she tried to communicate to him through messages of dreams, inspirations, you know, were led to be, to, to presume that all sorts of other beautiful sights on earth she sent to him to try and recapture his divinely orientated love. And eventually nothing would do less than her herself having to go to the outskirts of the inferno to plead with Virgil then in limbo to connect with Dante. She almost couldn't do it without Virgil's help. She realised that perhaps Virgil could still speak to him at the midpoint of his life when he awakens and realises that he's lost in the woods at the beginning of the inferno. And Virgil does so. Virgil too is awoken, I guess, and starts on his particular journey. And so he's carried through those infernal woods, now reaching these woods on the verge of paradise. But Beatrice concludes, 
he can't just drink the waters of the Lethe and forget all that's happened before. He's not like the angels who are just born into divine life. He must understand this. This is what God's way requires, which in this moment, at the end now of the canto, feels truly terrible. <laughs>